As with any of the books, or as you might want to call them, sections of this great work, The Republic, there's a lot going on in Republic Book 2, much of which we're actually not going to look at here because we want to keep this fairly focused uh, on the themes that we're most interested in for this World Views and Values class. So we're looking at, at a portion of Republic Book 2, which begins with Socrates uh, giving us a metaphor. Now, metaphor, something stands in place of another thing. It's something that's meant to be figurative. This, in this case, it's an analogy. And he says that if we're dealing with nearsighted people, then when we go from the little to the big, like letters, for example, this is hard to see, that little A there, right? But if we make it super big, a lot easier to see. Well, going from a single person to a state or a community is a lot easier because the state is larger. You can see what's going on. So let's say here, community. We may not be able to see what justice is yet in an individual person, although we're going to see what it is very quickly in book four, which is coming up. But we can find a little bit uh, larger scale and thus more visible way of looking at justice in terms of the community. And this goes to what I, something I was saying a little bit earlier in the previous video, that when we think of justice, we often don't think of the individual, or if we do think of the individual, we think of justice being done when they're punished, or them getting justice in the law court. Usually we tend to think about it in terms of social arrangements, about, you know, say, distribution of income and wealth. We talk about that, or equal opportunity in terms of justice. So even we, you know, can, can relate to this. It's easier to see how justice is supposed to play itself out in some sort of larger community, or we might say an institution. And we can understand community a bit broad, more broadly here to include, say, a family or a group of friends, any sort of grouping. This is going to lead us to thinking about the human condition. So what is the human condition? He's, he's raising this question. And he's going to frame it in terms of need. Why need? Why not in terms of intelligence or all sorts of other things that differentiate human beings? Well, he's, he's looking at something very basic here. As human beings, we are not self-sufficient. Let's think about what that would mean. So when we talk about a person as being self-sufficient, what we mean usually is that that person has enough wealth or enough income that, or enough goods, you know, if they're way up in the woods somewhere and say growing their own food, that they can take care of themselves. But then they would have to have some sort of stockpile. And there's a little bit of, of um, idealization going on when we talk about any human being being self-sufficient, or perhaps a qualification going on. They're, they can be self-sufficient in this way, but not other ways. If we're going to talk about it as being a human being as being self-sufficient in toto through their entire life, you're not going to find such a person. Even the people who you know go and live out in the mountains, off the grid, they often bring along with them tools, don't they? And that's what they use in order to be able to manufacture their own goods and, and live the kind of life that they're living. That's not really the case for the rest of us, though. We're caught up in an entire network of relationships with other people where oftentimes we mediate it through money, right? We give them some money and they give us some, some good or some service that we have a need for, or perhaps just a desire for, or even a wish for, right? But we're not actually self-sufficient. So what is our case then? We are needy. We have to get things from other people. It starts out in childhood, of course, with total dependence on parents or other caregivers. And how do we remedy this? Well, if we think, we're not going to begin with parents and caregivers, but we could do that here, just as a sort of thought experiment. 
what's going on in a family? So you've got some, some progeny. There could be adoption going on or, or actual natural reproduction. And a baby is being taken care of. So what is the baby being provided with? Food. It's being changed, clean clothes. It's being washed. It's being looked at. Without shared gaze and without touch, babies don't flourish and they, they often tend to die. Um, so there's an entire thing that's being supplied there. And it's pretty one way for the most part. I mean, some people say, I'm going to have a baby and then I'll have somebody to love me. That's a, that's a big mistake, right? Because babies are actually a lot of work. Um, and uh, it's hard to tell that they're loving you when they're screaming their, their, their head off or, or uh, you know, getting you... All, all dirty or waking you up in the middle of the night. Um, for a long time, there isn't reciprocity there. But within a family, certainly within a working traditional family, there is reciprocity. We've, we've changed that a little bit in our own society by you know, extending adolescence well into like, you know, 25th year. But that's not been the case through most of history. What is the human condition? Well, let's think about basic things. Humans have some sort of skill or some sort of talent. Some, let's call them aptitudes. And these can be developed. Now, you know, how do you know this? Well, you could take an aptitude test, I suppose, but they didn't have those in ancient Greece. So they would sort of keep an eye out. Does that person go over by the smith and watch what the smith does and imitate the, you know, hammering? Uh, are, they, are they curious about that sort of thing? Maybe that kid's going to be a good smith. What about this kid over here? You know, they certainly like to clean things up. Well, maybe they'll be a cleaner. That one over there, interested in reading, unlike all the rest of his, his uh, you know, friends, colleagues. Um, well, maybe he'll go on and, and do something a bit more academic, a bit more professional. Um, the idea that, that Plato has, and I think this is a very straightforward one, is that we have basic talents. And they can go multiple ways. He's going he's gonna to talk as if one person really can only do one thing, but we know that that's not completely the case. Um, it's certainly not the, the case for Plato, who's a little bit tricksy in that way. He was a wrestler at one time, um, and then decided he wanted to write poetry. And uh, apparently, you know, was pretty good at that, and then decided he wanted to be, do philosophy. So he had a couple career changes himself. Um, well, he wasn't a wrestler. He trained. You know, Plato, broad, is, is, is his name, because he had broad shoulders. So human beings have these aptitudes. And what, what's good about that? So these aptitudes, different humans, I'm say different people, make or provide different things. <clears throat> so <clears throat> not everybody has to do the same thing. Now, what, what does that allow? Well, you know, if you have person A and person B and person C and person D, they can swap these things back and forth. They don't all have to do the same activities. And what's the benefit of this? Well, you know, first off, it gets them out of a lot of work, but second, that's what actually allows them to develop these talents further. So he says, um, the state arises, I conceive, out of the needs of mankind. No one is self-sufficing, but all of us have many wants. As we have many wants, and many persons are required to supply them, one takes a helper for one purpose, another for another purpose. And when these partners and helpers are gathered together in one place, one habitation, the body of inhabitants is termed a state. They exchange with one another. One gives, another receives, under the idea that this exchange will be for the good. So person A has something that person B needs and gives it to person B. Person B, in, in return, gives person A something that they need. So this could be as simple as the, the occupations that he talks about. <clears throat> he says, well, what do we human beings actually require? Let's think about that. First and greatest of necessities is food. So we've got to have somebody doing the, the farming. We have to have somebody doing the fishing, the trapping, 
the whatever it is that we're going to do to get food, somebody's got to be out there making food. And in, in many um, pre-industrial societies, this can be a large percentage of the population involved in agriculture, involved in in sheep herding, involved in the uh, other things that have, you know, gathering, uh, planting, all the other things that go into the work with food. So food is a condition of life and existence. What else do we need as human beings? We need some place to live. Even if we're like nomadic people with yurts and, and going from place to place, somebody's got to make those. Somebody actually has to manufacture the tents. If we're going to just lay out under the stars in sleeping bags all the time, somebody's got to make sleeping bags. Clothing. That's another specialty. Not everybody's the same, uh, you know, uh, not everybody's at the same level of talent when it comes to making clothing, no matter how rude the clothing may be. So he says, let's, let's suppose that one person is a husbandman, that's somebody who takes care of animals, another a builder, another a weaver. Shall we add to them, say, a shoemaker, or perhaps some other purveyor to our bodily wants? And so they say, yeah, that sounds good. So we could get by with a pretty small population then. The barest notion of a state must include four or five people. How will they proceed? He says, we'll each bring the labor, the result of his labors into a common stock. Um, the individual husbandman producing for four. So this guy over here produces for four. And laboring four times as long and as much as he need in the provision of food. Or will he have nothing to do with the others and not be at trouble of producing for them, but produce for him himself alone a fourth of the food in a fourth of the time, and the remaining three-fourths of the time be employed in making a house or a coat or a pair of shoes? You know, does it make sense, Socrates says, for this guy over here just to, you know, spend his time, one quarter of his time doing the stuff for himself, and then do these other people's jobs? It doesn't make sense at all. It's not efficient. We get together into communities, according to this theory, we human beings associate because we need things that other people can supply, and those other people can supply them more effectively, more efficiently. So he says, um, how's the work going to get done best? Each one of these will have their own thing that they do. And I'm going to run out of shapes pretty soon. There we go. <laughs> Terrible hexagon. Um, each one has their own occupation that they're focused on. They're going to develop their talents. They have a social role now at this point. So this is the, the better way. Each workman has only one occupation. So he says, we're going to need more than four citizens, though. If we think out further what else we need for human life, the husbandman is not going to make his own plow or mattock or other implements of agriculture if they're going to be good for anything. So now we have to start adding in other people. And we start having all these relationships with them as well. And we get this very complex network of relationships that comprises a little society. So, he says, we're going to need quite a few people. We're going to need carpenters and smiths and other artisans, and our little state is starting to grow. This sounds pretty good, doesn't it, so far? And he says, even if we add all these other people, you know, you know like neat herds and shepherds and other herdsmen, these are people who take care of the animals, so that our, our farmers will have oxen to plow with, builders... Um, and couriers and weavers and you know, all sorts of people like that, our state's still not going to be that huge. Then he says, it's true, it's not going it, to, it'll be a, a fairly small state, but um, will we have everything that we need? Here we get to another interesting idea. Not only do we have human communities as their own little microcosms, you might say, in which human beings connect up with each other and share, trade, work, exchange. We also have probably didn't need to write human, right? We also have relationships 
between different communities. Because different communities may have resources or may manufacture goods or provide services that other communities need. So for example, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people get their grain from Egypt because it was easier to grow it in Egypt in just in huge quantities and then ship it to other places. And you need people who are actually going to do that trading back and forth, who are going to bring things from one place to another. So as he says, um, you're going to need another class of citizens who will bring the required supply from another city. If the trader goes empty-handed, he'll come back empty-handed. So if this city wants grain from this city, or wine, or salt, or whatever, they have to have something that they produce over here, maybe iron, where they can trade it back and forth, and the traders go between these cities. So every community is going to have to have a surplus. They're going to have to produce more than what they need because their needs are now being measured by what it is that they can get from other communities and that's going to require that they have something extra, something disposable that they can give them in return. Notice what's going on here. If you read between the lines, desires and needs are growing. We're going to reach a tipping point pretty soon. So he says, um, we're going to need more, uh, we're going to need more artisans, we're going to need more farmers, and we're going to need merchants. What else are we going to need? We're going to need a marketplace and some sort of money token for purposes of exchange. And we're going to need people to handle retail sales and wholesales and stuff like that. And we're even going to need laborers. We're going to need another class of servants who are intellectually hardly on the level of companionship, but have plenty of bodily strength for labor, which accordingly they sell and are called, if I do not mistake, hirelings, or as we would say, wage workers, hire being the name given to the price of their labor. And these are going to be part of our city. So what we've got going on here is this complex network, and that comprises a human community. And each human community is in relation to the other human communities. And now things start to sound pretty good. People are being taken care of. Um, the, the needs that they have are, are uh, being attended to. Socrates sketches something out, he says. Let's consider what their way of life is going to be. How can you tell if people are actually being you know, happy and realized and things are going well for them? Look at how they're living. So he says, will they not produce corn and wine and clothes and shoes and build houses for themselves? And when they're housed, they will work in summer, commonly stripped and barefoot, but in winter, substantially clothed and shod. They'll feed on barley meal and flour of wheat, baking and kneading them, making cakes and loaves. These they'll serve up on a mat of reeds or on clean leaves, themselves reclining the while upon beds strewn with yew or myrtle. Remember, the Greeks laid down to eat, not like us who sit, typically. And they and their children will feast, drinking of the wine which they have made, weaving garlands on their heads, hymning the praises of the gods, singing hymns to them, in happy converse with each other. This, this is going to make us happy. And they will take care that their, their families do not exceed their means, having an eye to poverty, not, not we want to have too many people, or, or war, because that can cause war. And then Glaucon says something really important, he says. But Socrates... You haven't given a relish to their meal. It's, it's not enough to have this stuff. Socrates is saying, this is enough that, that, you know, to satisfy a human being. Glaucon says, no, 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 no. That's not the good life. We need more than that. So Socrates says, you're right. They, they'll have little salt and olives and cheese, and they'll boil roots and herbs for dessert. They can have figs and peas and beans, and they'll roast myrtle berries and acorns by the fire, drinking in moderation. And with such a diet, they can live very long and happy lives. And Glaucon says, you're not getting me, Socrates. If you were providing for a city of pigs, how else would you feed the beasts? So Glaucon is saying, there's more to life than that. And Glaucon says, you should give them the ordinary conveniences of life. Think about our lifestyle and all the things that we're accustomed to. Like watching stuff on the internet. Is that a human necessity? It sure feels like it when the wireless goes out, doesn't it? We're like Glaucon in this case, quite often. He says, people who are to be comfortable have to lie on sofas and dine off tables, and they should have sauces and sweets in the modern style. 
And Socrates says, oh, now I get it. You're not interested just in the human community. You're interested, he says, um, a luxurious, luxurious human community. The one that's going to provide lots and lots of nice stuff, pleasures, things that satisfy our desires, perhaps even awaken desires we didn't even realize that we had. Now, if you're going to do that, um, he says, there's no harm in, in thinking this through. Uh, in such a state, we'll be more likely to see how justice and, and injustice originate. In my opinion, the true and healthy constitution of the state is the one which I've described. So Socrates is saying the best state is actually this, this simple one where we don't go beyond these, these basic needs and everybody just attends to these particular functions that are required to have a fairly simple but happy existence. But if we want it to be a city sort of like the one that we're accustomed to, now we're going to need more. What are we going to need more? He says, they'll be adding sofas and tables and other furniture. Now, you know, we take that for granted, I think. But also other dainties and perfumes and incense and courtesans. Courtesans means hookers uh, and cakes. All of these not of one sort only, but in every variety. We must go beyond the, nece the necessaries, as I was first speaking about, such as houses and clothes and shoes. The arts of the painter and the embroiderer will have to be set in motion. Gold and ivory and all sorts of materials must be procured. So what is that going to mean? Well, that means that we have to enlarge our borders. Why do we have to enlarge our borders? Because where we are is not going to be big enough for us. We're going to have to encroach on our neighbors. We're going to have to invade their territory, maybe even enslave them to get at what it is that we want. He says, the city will have to fill and swell with a multitude of callings which are not required for any natural want. We're going beyond nature to luxury. He says, the whole tribe of hunters and actors, um, the votaries of music, all sorts of other uh, creators of articles, including women's dresses. We're going to want more servants, as well as confectioners and cooks, and swine herds too, you know, pig herds, who are not needed. They must not be forgotten. And we're also going to need doctors, because we're going to be eating a bad diet, so we're going to start getting sick. We're also going to need lawyers, and we're going to need all sorts of people who we didn't originally imagine. But we're also going to have to deal with this. Are these other communities going to be okay with us doing that? They're probably in the process themselves of trying to expand because they like that stuff too, right? They're human beings. And now what are we going to have to take care of? War. We're going to have to fight. So we're going to have to have another class of people that are particularly important in the mix, aren't we? Now we're going to need soldiers or guardians, those who can protect the community, those who can fight on the community's behalf. He says, is war not an art? Remember, we said that everything gets done best if it's done by somebody who's got some talent and who can just focus in on that. We're going to need a whole class of people that are warriors. It's an art that requires as much attention as shoemaking. So we're also going to need people to arm them, to, to armor them, all these sorts of year, so, sorts of things. And what we're going to be interested in is who has the aptitude for handling this vital function of the society. He says... The higher duties of the guardian, the more time, skill, and art and application will be needed from him. He's going to need a natural aptitude for his calling, so we're going to have to select, if we can, natures that are fitted for the task of guarding the city. This is not going to be an easy task. And he says these, these people have to be sort of like dogs, well-bred dogs. 
They have to be quick to see, swift to overtake the enemy when they see him, strong too if when they have caught him they have to fight with him. All these qualities are going to be needed. He's going to have to be brave. And we have some sense of the bodily qualities that are required um, and, and some of the mental qualities, but this raises a problem. These types often don't get along with each other or with other people, right? He says, are not these spirited natures apt to be savage with one another and with everybody else? So what do we want? We want them to be savage with the enemies, but not with their own people. We want them to be like dogs in the, the sense that they're going to bark at people they don't recognize and fawn on people who they do. So what are we going to need for that? We're actually going to need another kind of people. We're going to need guardians to guard the guardians, to direct them. And that's where we're going to get into some of the other interesting ideas in this dialogue.